tire. No, what are you doing? Oh, that was. Mm, all right. We are in War on the Saints, chapter 12, at the top of 292. The after counterfeit of the true is also marked by one, the inability to recognize and unite with the spirit of God in others. This being contrary to the pattern of the oneness of the body shown in 1 Corinthians 12, where the same spirit in each member is in harmony with the spirit in the other. Two, the spirit of separation and division on account of not seeing eye to eye in non-essential matters for union of spirit, where the Holy Spirit <coughs> ruling and working is possible apart from the unity of faith, which can only be according to the degree of knowledge. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Why believers do not obtain the baptism of the Spirit? Believers who know that a baptism of the Spirit is possible and obtainable by them may not receive that baptism because of many misconceptions about experiences. The reception of the Holy Spirit and the Pentecostal measure of the endowment or clothing of the Spirit, endowment or clothing of the Spirit or clothing of the spirit may vary in manifestation and result according to the preparation of and the knowledge of the believer. Many do not receive the baptism of the spirit because they have misconceptions which hinder them from cooperation with the spirit of God in his workings. On account of these varying facts in connection with it and the consequent apparent contradiction, contradictions of teaching about it. And incidentally, the, the baptism of the spirit, it doesn't mean that you don't have the spirit in you. It means that you're not using it, baptized, right? You're not introduced to. <laughs> the reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit. After the manner of the Lord's dealing with his disciples and born out of the experience of many today, it is clear that there is a reception of the Holy Spirit answering to the experience of the Easter day as the initial stage of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the endowment of power by an influx of the Spirit of God into the human spirit, which liberates the man for utterance and for witness bearing. The reception of the Holy Spirit in its initial form requires certain conditions which the believer should be able, should be able quickly and simply to fulfill. The one putting away of every known sin in the life Two, the definite trust in the power of the blood of the Christ to cleanse from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, three, obedience right up to the edge of light through the word of God. Four, full surrender to God as his entirely with not one thing clung to and withheld from him. Five, the act of faith in which the believer fulfilling these conditions takes the gift of the Holy Spirit as simply as he received the gift of eternal life through Christ. Believers should understand that these simple conditions can be carried out by the action of the will alone with no conscious feeling of any kind. Once the transaction is made, it should be held to persistently and steadily without question or deviation from a fixed volition. That is a fixed will. In some cases, the entry of the Holy Spirit into the renewed spirit in the manifestation of the fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness. Faith. Amen. So, amen. So, uh, once again, in some cases, the entry of the Holy Spirit into the renewed spirit in the manifestation of the fruit of the spirit very quickly follows fulfillment of these conditions. But the believer should be on guard not to turn any experience as the basis of continued faith, or it will pass uh, quickly pass away. 
the transaction with God upon his word, God's word, stands good, whether manifested in spirit consciousness, man's spirit, of the Holy Spirit's presence or not. Once made, the transaction should be held to experience or no experience by the surrendered believer. It is from this stage that the spirit of God now works to discipline and lead the believer on into knowledge of the greater influx of his power, God's power, which is the endowment for service and for aggressive warfare against the principalities and powers of Satan. Amen. The endowment for service and the conditions. Some say they have prayed for hours for this needed equipment to no purpose. Others have spent weeks or months in waiting upon God for some experience they think accompanies the baptism with very grave results in a, in a counterfeit power breaking forth upon them with manifestations afterwards acknowledged to have come from deceiving spirits of Satan. Others have received a true influx of the spirit, but through ignorance and misconceptions have given place to the same time to the workings of evil spirits in the physical frame. See page 54. This we have already dealt with in earlier chapters and need only now set forth the conditions for knowing the endowment for service and the effects which follow. The awakened sense of need. In the first place, there must be a definite assurance that such an endowment of power is possible and a deep con conviction of and sense of need. This may come about in the believer by his discovering that he has no effectiveness in his life and service, although he may have known for years the Holy Spirit in his, that's the Holy Spirit's indwelling power. Especially the sense of need may be acute in lack of utterance and power to witness for God. An almost complete absence of the aggressive power against the forces of darkness so marked in the early church. Sometimes those who are thus being moved by the spirit to the sense of need, which precedes the greater influx of his power, the Holy Spirit's power, are, are diverted and hindered from pressing on by others who are not at the same stage of spiritual life and who say this endowment is not obtainable. A believer in such a case should put aside the voices of men and dealing with God direct, put to the proof for himself whether God will meet his awakened need. Amen. That is a mouthful. That's a huge mouth. <laughs> Some people will hold you back. This means a definite transaction with God that one, he will give you, he will give to the suppliant what he means by a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Everybody knows what a suppliant is? One asking. He will give to the suppliant what he means by a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And two, in his own way, grant to his God's redeemed one the liberty of utterance and power for effective service, which he, the man, should have for fulfilling his part as a member of the body of Christ. This should be a transaction with God in a deliberate act of the will, which must not be departed from, whatever the after experience may be. This is the taking of the endowment of the spirit by faith on the ground of the word of God. Christ redeemed, having become a curse for us, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. As we have seen, 
there is no command given to the church after Pentecost to wait for the, for the personal endowment for service. The spirit of the Lord fell upon those in the house of Cornelius without any waiting. And he will do so upon any believer directly. He is in the right attitude. That's the, the believer is in the right attitude and fulfilling the conditions for the spirit of God to flood the man's spirit with, the, with his power, the Holy Spirit's power. The waiting on the part of the believer is really a patient waiting for the spirit of God to do the work in him that is required after he has definitely dealt with God for such an endowment of God's spirit. A waiting which is consistent with the faithful discharge of the duties of ordinary life, wherein he learns the minute minute obedience to all the known will of God, which is necessary when he is given more definite service later. Later on. Amen. Amen. The obstacles to the baptism of the Spirit. During this period, the believer's faith dealing with God must continue to be active. Yeah, trusting. No, awesome. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Trusting the Spirit of God to prepare him for the endowment required for his sphere of service. The danger now is the using of excuses <laughs> to cover up. <laughs> to cover, page 102 or column five. The danger now is the using of excuses to cover up the lack of power or else shrinking from the examination of points in the life which the spirit of God is dealing with or even quenching the spirit of that spirit of God by refusing to yield up to God what, he, what God claims or quailing from some sacrifice upon which turns the liberation of the spirit of, of the seeker for the influx of the greater measure of power. In the initial reception of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the conditions necessary dealt with a narrow sphere. It meant just the center of the man dealt with in will and heart, the former in surrender to God and the latter cleansed from the love of sin. Mm -hmm. Cleanse from the love of sin. I like that. But in the adumen of power, the scope of God's dealing widens. The man's spirit has to be separated from the entanglements of the soul and the lawful things belonging to the natural or soul man have to be surrendered so that he may become a spiritual man governed only by his spirit. He must have every trace of an un bending spirit and it's noted it is in this sense that the word impurity is used on page 78 in connection with the human spirit the impurity of the mixture of soul and spirit in contrast to pure spirit which unites with the spirit of god in his central essence the human spirit should be freed from the unbending element of the soul to move in pliable correspondence with the Holy Spirit. Once again, once again, and be freed from a narrow grasping spirit. Sorry, up, further up. He must have every trace of an unbending spirit removed that his spirit may cooperate with the Holy Spirit with pliability. He must lose every degree. Listen carefully. This is tough. He must lose every degree of an unforgiving spirit. Amen. So as to give no inlet to evil spirits. Mm -hmm. When, by the moving of the Holy Spirit, he may be charged to rebuke sin or suffer rejection for Christ's sake. And be freed from a narrow grasping spirit if he is to be a wide channel for the outflow of gracious life-giving spirit of God. He must lose every degree of an unforgiving spirit. Moreover, the man who seeks an endowment of power and must be willing for the spirit of God thoroughly to deal with his life and remove out of it every obstacle to his, the man's immediate readiness to fulfill all the will of God. He must be searched in motive 
and taught the principles of righteousness for the endowment of the spirit of God, which he seeks to know means an aggressive warfare against sin and the powers of evil. And how can the Holy Spirit convict of sin by the preaching of righteousness if the man he equips as a messenger of God is ignorant of the law of righteousness? He must learn what God's attitude to sin is in his own life before, before he can be God's witness against sin in others. others. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Why delay in the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Got all this highlighted here. If a believer has made the transaction with God for the baptism of the Spirit and taken it by faith and for a prolonged period, there is no evidence and experience he should renew his prayer to God for the removal of all obstacles as quickly as possible and be on the alert to cooperate with God in every trace of light given him. Misconceptions as to the way of the spirit, as the spirit, the Holy Spirit will work, may prevent the believer recognizing the evidence that his prayer has been answered. He may be expecting an experience similar to some other believer or have thought in his mind governed by his wishes or prayers, which blinds him to the working of the Holy Spirit in an opposite manner. It is here that advantage is given to the spirits of evil. If the believer is bent upon some special mark as evidence of the baptism, the deceiving spirits use every possible means to give the seeker the counterfeit. The influx of the spirit of God into the believer's spirit bears its own evidence in the, real, in the release of the man's spirit into light, liberty, and power, resulting in liberty of utterance for witness bearing and the co-working conviction of others by the Holy Spirit, which is the ultimate purpose of his coming. His, the Holy Spirit, is coming. Believers who are being disciplined and trained by the Holy Spirit for the endowment of power should continue in present service for Christ in the keenest faithfulness up to light using to the full measure of grace already received. For it is in the path of faithful service. It is, is, sorry, it is in the path of faithful service that the assurance of the endowment of power may be given. It is God's law that his children use all he has given them before he gives more. The believer must demonstrate his obedience to God to the utmost extent of his present knowledge, learning to heed the sense, sense of his spirit and using his mind and judgment in reliance upon the illuminating spirit of, of the spirit of God as he seeks to know the mind of God in his word. And it says here, three warning words may be given to believers at this point of experience. One, do not obey an exterior or apparently interior voice. Mm. Two, do not locate God as in or around. Do not pray to God as in or around in the atmosphere, but as in heaven. And it says, uh, see pages 124, 131, on the mistaken location of God. We know that God as a personage is up in the third heaven and with, his, with, with, with Jesus his son, the son of God, sitting at his right hand. So the father is sitting up in the third heaven in his, on his throne with Jesus sitting at his right hand. And they're both God, right? <laughs> Two thirds of it anyway. <laughs> uh, the speaking in tongues. Here we go. The speaking in tongues. A question arises here as to whether believers may now speak in unknown tongues as the disciples did at the time of the Holy Spirit's infilling at Pentecost. There are those that say yes, but the truths set forth in preceding chapters show that until spiritual section of the Church of Christ are more acquainted with the counterfeiting methods of the spirits of evil and the laws which give them power of working, any testimony 
to such experience as true cannot be safely relied upon. Mm. Should I say it one more time? <laughs> cannot yeah. be safely relied upon. Let it be said again. Revival is an outflow of the spirit of God through the organ of the human spirit. And the baptism of the spirit is the influx of the spirit of God into the man's spirit, whereby it is released from all obstacles and bonds which oppress or hold it down and closes or reduces its capacity as an outflow for the Holy Spirit. These obstacles may return through the deceptive workings of the adversary and the believer become locked up in spirit again or rendered practically useless, only practically, <laughs> practically useless to God and his people. The objectives of the truths about the powers of darkness. There are two objectives to the truths which have been set forth in preceding pages. The first is, the removal of these obstacles so that the revival power which is lying locked up in many may break forth once more and the church of christ press on into maturity and power victorious over the powers of darkness hindering her progress these have gained their purpose of checking revival through the ignorance of god's people but they can be defeated and driven back from the ground they have gained by knowledge of their workings and by aggressive prayer against them. The truths about them when put into operation will not only set free individual believers, but disperse the block in the atmosphere in a church or a town or a country. Amen. Amen. If it is proved that one evil spirit can be rendered powerless by prayer, then all the hosts of Satan in their onslaught on the church can be conquered if the children of God would use the weapons of victory. If all hell has been conquered by Christ, the forces of Satan can be turned back and the church of Christ delivered from their power. Why God permits Satan's attacks. The hindrance to aggressive warfare against the foe lies in the unwillingness of the church to face the truth. Not in the lack of weapons for victory. Believers are content because they are ignorant of their state. Yeah, right. The good, yeah, the good they have blinds them to the greater good and the greater need of the church. Therefore, to arouse them from their self-satisfied condition, God has permitted Satan to sift his people for Satan cannot go one shade beyond the permission of God. Amen. Amen. Believers will be taught the truth about themselves only by experience. Therefore God permits experience. The church of Christ must be matured and prepared for the Lord's appearing. Therefore God permits the onslaught of the foe, for only through the fire of sifting will the people of God be urged forward to the battle and victory will, and victory which will drive the forces of Satan from their place in the heavenlies, making the way for the church to ascend to her place of triumph with the Lord. Wrong conceptions of divine things can only be destroyed by experience. Many of the children of God are deceived whilst they think they are protected by God. They comply with the conditions for God to work apart from intelligent understanding of why he does so. And they do not realize that it is just as possible ignorantly to comply with the conditions for, all, for the evil spirits to work through ignorance of the laws governing both divine and satanic workings. The supernatural manifestations of the present time are being forced upon the notice of the Church of Christ by the wreckage of work for God and of devoted individual believers. Other children of God 
go into the midst of such manifestations in a blind confidence that God will protect, yet often they are not protected because they do not understand the conditions for such protection. Sometimes their confidence covers a wrong condition in themselves, which is hidden from their knowledge. In other words, they have a secret self-confidence that they are capable of judging what they see and hear, which has no basis of true reliance upon God through a deep consciousness of their ignorance. Two, a secret spirit of curiosity or desiring to see what is wonderful. Three, a secret wanting to go to such gatherings without first seeking with an unbiased mind a clear knowledge of the will of the Lord, where they may have, four, a real purpose of obtaining more blessing from God, which covers a deeply hidden pride or some self-ambition to be among the first in the kingdom of God. Any of these hidden clauses, causes can frustrate God's protection. But where there is a pure, true, pure, single-eyed reliance upon God to protect from the wiles of Satan with a keen watching unto prayer and a ready mind open to truth as God gives it, together with an unbiased faithfulness to the will of God, even though for purposes greater than the personal good, the far-seeing wisdom of God may allow the believer to discover by sore experience the deceptive workings of the counterfeit fitter, such a one will be able to say out of them, the Lord, all the Lord deliver me out of them. All the Lord delivered me. Second Timothy three eleven, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Amen. All right. Satan's victims made victors. The second and greatest ultimate result of ultimate result of the operation of the truths concerning the deceptive workings of Satan and the way of victory is in the connection with the dispensational position of the church in view of the closing days of the age and the millennial appearing of the ascended Lord. That millennial appearing of the glorified Christ means to Satan and his hierarchy of powers, the triumph of his earnest wild victims and the, of, his, of Satan's victims, who, right. who, who was who? All, our, all of us, right? Right. <laughs> to his hierarchy, the triumph of his earnest wild victims and their ascension to the throne of Christ, where in reigning with their Lord, they will judge angels. That's right. First Corinthians 6, verses 2 and 3. Do ye not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Amen. It means to the fallen archangel, the deepest cut, of humiliation he has yet to drink. Keep his cup of humiliation he has yet to drink. When redeemed man, who was for a little while made lower than the angels. Hebrews 2, 7. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. So once again, when redeemed man, who was for a little while made lower than the angels and cast down by his fall near the level of the beast is lifted up again and made to sit amongst princes. Lifted up above the high position which Satan once occupied as a great archangel of God. Lifted up to one nature, one life and position with the son of God as an heir of God and joint heir with Christ. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. 
and Hebrews 2, verses 11 and 12. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Amen. Lift it up with the redeeming Lord far above all principality and power and every name that is named in heaven or on earth or below the earth, lifted up to the very side of the triumphant Lord, to the place of judgment of the, of the foe. For Satan, there awaits, awaits the abyss and the bottomless pit, the lake of fire. For his victims, the sharing of the throne of the Son of God above the angels and archangels of God. The name of the Calvary victor and its power. <laughs> it is a marvel then that at the close of the age and on the eye of the millennial triumph of the church, the whole hierarchy of evil powers endeavor to submerge the future judges of the fallen hosts of Satan. Is it a marvel? <laughs> it certainly is. Is it any marvel that God permits the onslaught for it has been his way throughout the ages to use this planet as the battleground and training school of his people. Hallelujah. Amen. The son of God himself has become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross before he was given the name, which is above every other name. That name, which now speaks to every fallen angel and every evil spirit among the dregs of the spirit world and the, of the conquest of Calvary, and every member of Christ who will reign with them and share in his judgment of the fallen angels must individually, whilst on the planet, learn first in person, not only to walk in victory over sin, but to trample underfoot the viper brood of hell. Amen. Amen. In the name of the conqueror. In the name of the conqueror. They must overcome as he is overcame, if they are to share his throne and conquest. He led the way. They must follow. That's we must follow. Amen. He passed through the hour and power of darkness on Calvary and passed through it to the place of victory. United to him in spirit, they, we, pass through the same dark atmosphere filled with the hosts of evil to their place of triumph our place of triumph in him. The closing onslaught from the host of darkness is upon the church. Not one living member of the risen head can escape attack if he is a true joint in the body. Amen. Ephesians 4.16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Some will know it before others, according to their place in the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Those who are the, of the feet will know it latest, but know it they will, for they who are the feet must also ascend through the foot to be the last to move heavenly and is nearest earth of the ascending body. Some of the elect of the body, yea, many will may fall, fall victims to the deceptive wiles of Satan. But though they may have been sub seem submerged for a while and to their own vision rendered useless to the Lord, if they but see how all the deceits of Satan can be turned into steps of victory and equipment for the deliverance of others from his power, they can arise again and become, as it were, eyes to the body of Christ in its advance through the aerial hosts of darkness contesting the way. They can rise again when they discover what was meant by Satan to overwhelm them, can be changed by the light of truth into the glorious liberation from the enemy's power. And thus, 
make them witnesses, not only to men, but to the principalities and mm. the powers in the heavenly regions. Ephesians 3.10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. There you go. Once again, and thus make them witnesses. That's, that's who, who are we talking? Let's go, let me go back. They can arise again when they discover that what was meant by Satan to overwhelm them can be changed by the light of truth into glorious liberation from the enemy's power. power. Yes. And thus make them witnesses, not only to men, but to the principalities and powers in the heavenly regions of the manifold wisdom of God. Yeah, the, the hierarchy. People, we got victory. Yes. Amen. Amen. The hierarchy of Satan. Of satanic power may hope to delay their judgment for a season. <laughs> and, uh, they're short time here. But yeah. the purposes of God must ultimately come to pass. He will draw his church through to, uh, to join the risen head in due season, even though the hour and power of darkness now surrounds her. The ultimate of the, the, ultimate of the call to war against the powers of darkness is revival. Exclamation. But that ultimate of that revival, which will come as the result of victory over Satan, is ascension triumph, the millennial appearing of the Christ and the casting down of Satan and his evil powers to the abyss. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's War on the Saints. Yep. What a great read tonight. And next week, we will get into some interesting things with like the summary of ground. So stay tuned. Take three next week. Here we go.